So I am Annette Decker. I am a ER physician. I'm currently doing a research fellowship that's focusing on health equity at UCLA. I've heard this term crisis standard of care. I don't know what it means. And Dave Shurega says you do. So can you explain what a crisis standard of care is? Yeah, Mel. So a crisis standard of care is really an operational plan that's enacted by a healthcare system when there just aren't enough resources to do our normal standard of care. So examples of when this might happen would be an example of a catastrophic event, so like a hurricane or an earthquake, or alternatively, a more pervasive change, such as a pandemic, such as COVID-19. So who sets them? Does the state set them? Does a hospital set them? Does the ER set them? Who does this setting? Yeah, so they're generally made on a state level, and it's a pretty diverse committee that comes together to decide what these guidelines will be. Generally, it includes providers, medical ethicists, uh, public health experts, and then again, local and state government officials. And are there legal protections that go with this? So let's say the state comes along and say, okay, you don't have to intubate all the 95-year-olds who have COPD and other medical conditions. You can now only think about doing that to 85-year-olds. That's you know sort of a random example. Um, so are there legal protections or can people come back later and say, oh, I don't care about there was a pandemic last year. You should yeah. have done more. On face value, none of the protocols that I have read through explicitly protect physicians. Um, I think to get explicit protection, you would really need the governor to make a declaration of immunity, which has happened in a few states. That being said, uh, when we move to crisis standards of care, there really is a general understanding that we're no longer operating in our standard of care protocol. We're really moving to this adjusted protocol in this crisis time. So I'm not a lawyer, but I would imagine that it would be hard pressed to find um, a case against a physician if they were operating within these guidelines. Yeah, it seems that that would be difficult if everybody in the community is basically doing the same thing to say that you practiced outside the standard of care, because the standard of care is what everybody in the community would generally do. Exactly. Uh, so what, what do these actually do you think would look like uh, California, if some of the modeling is correct, is going to be completely overwhelmed. We are not going to be able to intubate lots and lots of people and do what we are currently doing today. Do you have any sense of what some of these might look like? Yeah. So for us as ER physicians, the question of triage is really going to be about critical care, whether that is uh, access to an ICU bed or a ventilator or ICU personnel or potentially even oxygen. Um, so on a, on a practical level, what would happen is that your hospital would set up a triage committee or a triage team. So you as an individual physician wouldn't necessarily be making those decisions yourself. And in most of these crisis standards of care, the decision of how and kind of who and what gets triaged is based on an algorithm. In most of them, the algorithm that is used is the SOFA score or the se sequential organ failure assessment score. And so you as a physician would potentially um, send the objective measures of how your patient is doing to the committee and the committee would then decide who gets the ICU bed, who gets the ventilator. Um, oftentimes the cutoff on this that I'm seeing is like a SOFA score greater than 11 potentially would exclude you from getting those resources. The one thing I would note, Mel, is that this applies not just to patients who have COVID-19, but to anyone coming into your ER. So if you have someone that's a trauma or a head bleed, you would also be applying these triage criteria just as the patient that you're thinking about intubating because of respiratory distress. Excellent. So this is often done or usually done by... Uh, a group that's separate from the clinical areas, separate uh, from the emotion that could be going with that, uh, taking the heat for you, basically. And do you have a sense uh, that we are getting to that in some uh, regions of California? Yeah. So, I mean, I work clinically here in LA in a couple of different places, and um, I worked a shift yesterday, and I certainly think that we're getting closer to that threshold. Um, at one of the hospitals where I'm working, we're actually being asked to document SOFA scores for everyone who's being admitted to the ICU. That's not being used to triage anyone yet, um, but it certainly gives me the, the feeling that we're getting closer. How does this work when you have a hospital in an area, in a wealthy area that's well resourced, and a hospital down the road that is not in a rich area and is less well resourced, how does that fit into it? I can imagine that there'd be more ICUs and more intensivists at the rich hospital than the poor hospital. Do you, how does that work when you really want to do this equitably? Do you transfer patients between the two? How do you do that? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that, Mel. So really a crisis standard of care does not work with an individual hospital. This needs to be either on a county, regional, or state level, because you can imagine if, if one hospital has more ICU beds, you're really going to have hospital shopping of going to the hospital that has more resources. So 
for these crises to work and really how they are designed is that they would be on a, a larger scale and that you really would have the ability to transfer patients as needed. I have to say, I'm really interested in the health equity piece of this. So crisis standards of care are really not scientific protocols that are being designed. They're really questions of value and what we value as a society. And so when people sit down to decide these, it's usually a question of how do we want to prioritize where our care is going? And that um, ultimately in the, in the protocols that I've seen really come down to questions like the number of lives saved or the number of life years saved. And I've gotten involved on in this question because I'm concerned that by prioritizing care in this way, we are potentially disproportionately denying care to communities of color that have already been um, and really very severely impacted by COVID-19. So I'm actually working with a group of other ER physicians that's um, led by Dr. Ruby Long out of Wisconsin. And, and we're trying to devise a way to come up with these crisis standards of care that more efficiently includes community input on this and how they value how these decisions are made. So our goal is to come up with a way to really do a restorative justice approach to these protocols um, so that we can be thinking more about health equity and try to mitigate some of these um, disparities that have come up in the, in the last you know, months, but obviously also years. So you don't like uh, QSOFA scores or like just put in their age and their obesity status and uh, that'll just give us a number and we'll use the number. You don't think that's uh, the way to do it? No, I think, um, you know, I, I think there are a lot of problems with the SOFA score. And I think if you talk to really any ER doctor or intensivist, they will tell you the list of complaints. Um, for starters, the original study uh, that validated the SOFA score and its association with mortality was really a, a study done of only 350 patients. And, and of that, the patients who had a score greater than 11 were more on the range of 21 patients. And it was that study that showed that you have a mortality greater than 90% if your SOFA score is greater than 11. But as you can imagine, that's a very small number that we're now you know, taking and ex extrapolating to these crisis standards of care. There's been follow-up studies that look at the um, H1N1 pandemic and how the SOFA score plays out there and the mortality in those situations for patients who have a score greater than 11 is more like 50%, which is quite different than 90%. So it seems um, just purely from a medical standpoint, um, you know, questionable to base those decisions only on the SOFA score. But then the, the problem where I get more concerned from a health equity standpoint, you can imagine that individuals with chronic comorbidities, such as CAKD, um, are going to have higher levels of creatinine, which is one of the factors that's included in the SOFA score. And there's really no accommodation or correction factor for what your baseline CKD is. On top of that, you can imagine that um, individuals who are um, again, historically disadvantaged are, are potentially coming in later, coming in sicker, and therefore also have worse SOFA scores, um, which is, is really a question for us as a society of, you know, how do we value care? Um, Doug White has actually put out a paper recently that talks about how we can potentially add health equity back into these crisis standards of care. And he suggests using a correction factor in addition to the SOFA score that would really be looking at the area deprivation index to try to account for some of these inequities. So can you explain how that actually works? Are you saying something like, if you're from a, a poorer community or if you're from a high risk group, if you're for a person of color, you might have more chronic disease burden. So therefore the QSOFA score is gonna kick in for that group of patients sooner than it would for another group of patients. Therefore they get less care overall. I want to clarify one thing. This is really using the whole SOFA score, not the Q SOFA score. So the whole SOFA score is really using six different organ systems. So a little more extensive than our Q SOFA that we traditionally think of. And to come to your second point, um, correct. So I think what we've been seeing with COVID-19 is that communities of color have certainly been disproportionately impacted on every level. So uh, being diagnosed with COVID-19, being hospitalized, and then obviously also mortality. So I could imagine that if we start applying the SOFA score as our way of triaging that these individuals who have historically been disadvantaged and disadvantaged in this pandemic are likely going to have higher scores 
And so when you get to the question of who gets care, um, if you have a higher score, you're not going to get that ICU bed or you're not going to get that ventilator. So my you know, argument is when we're thinking about um, us as a society really in some ways have created these disparities that are, are causing um, disproportionate impacts of COVID-19 in these communities, we probably have an obligation, or I would argue we have an obligation as society to, to create ways that mitigate for these disparities when we're thinking about these crisis standards of care. Is there any simple way to do that? Is there a, like any magical correction factor you can get to make that equitable? You know, it, it's tough. Um, but the the best example I've seen of this recently is a paper by uh, Doug White. And his suggestion was including a correction of the SOFA score with a area deprivation index. So that is an existing score that you can actually just find online. And all you need is a patient's address. And typically speaking, that score accounts for a lot of the um, inequities that we're thinking about here. And so that could be included um, and potentially you would get um, kind of points reduced, hypothetically speaking, um, if you were in an area that had a higher score. Thanks for your time, Annette. Thanks for describing that. You're going to hear this term again as we talk about palliative care, but I wanted Annette to come in and explain it, the term so that uh, you, we could smoothly do that discussion. So thanks again for your time. Thanks for having me, Mel.